give a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield, Clark County area or looking for a new church home, we invite you to make St. John your new church home. This being a celebration of communion, all of your service is in your worship bulletin except for the hymns. So we we'll only need the red hymnal for the hymns when we sing. Everything else is printed here, so I would ask that you turn to page two in your worship bulletin and invite those who can without difficulty to please stand as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship with the order of confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is October the 5th, 17th Sunday after Pentecost. Our theme today is Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. This is how firm a foundation that gives us all the promises from God. It was written by a, a Baptist minister and his uh, music director and published in the Ripon Book of Hymns in 1787. A very popular hymn a firm of foundation and it gives us all the promises from God. English hymn.
and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Today, and the theme is God gives us all that is good. This morning, our first reading is from Isaiah. Let me sing from my beloved, my love song concerning his end. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and prepared the stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower, tower in the midst of it, and hewed out a wine He expected And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. A horn is there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it. When I expected to yield grapes, why did you yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its edge, and it shall be cut out. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned for hope, and it shall be overgrown. Briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. But expected justice, but felt bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
singing responsibly Psalm 80. Singing the gospel acclamation is Pastor Pollock, pastor of our church, is ascending the pulpit. We believe that Jesus is standing next to him as he reads the gospel.
stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone whom it fall, on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seen. A couple of announcements to share with you. First of all, a message from Vern Combs. Most of you all remember Vern, who was custodian for a while. He has been in Jewish Hospital in Cincinnati for treatment. And he shared with us the good news that everything is in remission. He's doing quite well. He wants to thank all of you for your many cards and phone calls. And he said, pass on these words to God and bless you all. So, Burns is doing quite well and really appreciates all your concern for him. Remember, October 26th, the last Sunday of this month, is Reformation Sunday. The color of the day is red. So for that on Pentecost and two days that we encourage everyone to wear red in honor of the occasion. So October 26th, Reformation Sunday, please wear red. Also, please mark on your calendars to stay after church on that Sunday, where we will be having a special activity following this 1030 worship. At this point, that is all I can tell you. I need to Clear a couple of things with a couple of council members yet that I haven't had an opportunity to speak to. Uh, but next week I'll be able to give you more details. But October 26th we'll be having something special going on, so you will want to stay after church and enjoy. It. So uh, that is Reformation Sunday. And then just again to remind you, November 9th, Sunday before Veterans Day, uh, my nephew Green Beret Charles. Coleman's Tracy will be here to preach um, as he prepares to enter seminary in the seminary and begin his theological studies to eventually, hopefully, become a chaplain for the Green Brothers. Special music by the choir, directed by Vicki Perks. 17th Sunday after Pentecost. This is October 4th, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A little boy came running home one day very excited to share some news with his mother. In fact, he was so excited that as he ran through the back gate, he forgot to close the gate, had to stop, run back and close it. Then he came barreling through the back screen door and let it slam against the door. And once upon finally finding his mother, he exclaimed, Mama, I just saw a man who makes horses. And his mother looked at him and kind of smiled. She said, Now, son, are you sure? And he hardly could contain himself, said, Yes, Mama. In fact, as I was passing by, he was just nailing on his back feet. <laughs> now, we can laugh at the innocence of a misconception by a little boy who had never seen a blacksmith at work before and didn't realize that all the blacksmith was doing was putting shoes on the back hooves of that horse and that he hadn't had really made it. That is funny or humorous. But what is not a laughing matter, what is not humorous, are the many people today who have lost sight of whose world this is and who we are in a relationship with by living in this world. Unfortunately today, the popular opinion among many is that the world belongs to we human beings and therefore we can do with it what we want. Scientific knowledge and technology have made such advancements that to many people it seems that the world is now at our beck and call. In light of this belief, many have forgotten their true place in relation to the creation and the creator. As the old hymn says, this is my father's world. And not only does the old hymn tell us that this is my father's world, but more importantly, Holy Scripture itself reminds us over and over that this is God's creation, something that God has given to us to take care of. Holy Scripture reminds us that we are responsible to God and we are responsible for what we do with and what we do to this creation in which we live. In the parable, in our gospel reading for this morning, from that 21st chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew, there are many lessons in that parable. The most obvious is, as you heard or read, I really don't have to explain to you, but I'm sure you can figure that easily, is Jesus has given the parable of foreshadowing what was going to happen to him. The vineyard was Israel, the nation of Israel. The tenants were the Jewish people and their religious leaders. The slaves who came to collect the produce of the prophets. Then, of course, God sends his only son. They kill him. And then they face destruction. Well, there's some other lessons in that parable that upon first reading, maybe you didn't quite grasp. Or maybe you didn't realize. And it is one of the second lessons that I want to share with you this morning. And that is the parable not only is speaking about Jesus and foreshadowing his passion and his resurrection and ascension, God's plan of salvation. But this parable also deals with the question of whose world is it? <coughs> whose world is it anyway? And what the parable is telling us is that the world belongs to God. As we look back at that parable to verse 33, we read, Hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. He leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. The vineyard would be a very common image to the people to whom Jesus was speaking. Scripture throughout the Old Testament referred to 
Israel, as we heard in our reading from Isaiah, referred to Israel and Judah as a vineyard that God had created. And so the imagery is not foreign to them. They understand what Jesus is saying. They understand what he's describing. So the second lesson here is that the vineyard not only is Israel and Judah, but the vineyard is God's creation. And in that creation, God has provided for us everything we need. As he said, he planted a vineyard, set a hedge around it. Now, your translation on the reading insert said a fence. But actually, what they would do is it was a, a hedge of thorns. Uh, something like from the old story of Sleeping Beauty, you know, a type of thorn hedge that you couldn't get through without hacking, cutting. And the purpose of that was to keep out the wild boars. And other wild animals who might try to get into the vineyard and, and eat the grapes. And to keep away thieves who might want to get in. It also says he set a watchtower where someone then could guard it and keep away the thieves and, and wild animals that might try to steal the grapes or eat the grapes. And then he put a wine press there. That is so then once the grapes were harvested, they could be taken right, right to the wine press, uh, be crushed, and the process of wine making begin. So as we read this, it should remind us of God's creation and how he has provided everything for us. As we think back to Genesis and the account of God creating the world, how he put every tree that we needed, every vine, every type of bird, fish in the sea, the cattle, all the different type of animals. And so without question, the landowner represents God in this parable, the Father and the Creator of the world. He owns the world and all that is in it. He puts the stars in the heavens, the planets on their courses, and does all that is needed for life. As we read of this, we think about how God has provided us with everything we need. And how he sends the rain upon the just and the unjust so that the crops may grow, so that we may be fed. God doesn't withhold the rain from those who are unjust, from those who are evil, because the food they are raising, even though they may be uh, evil and malicious, their food they grow in is needed by a hungry world. So God lets it rain on the just and unjust. He lets the sun shine so it will cause the plants to grow up out of the earth. He allows the night to fall so it cools down the earth and the plants can receive more nourishment. He does all that is necessary for the world. As the owner of the world, God can do what he desires and what he doesn't desire. And we to be respectful of that creation. As a crown of creation, God has placed us in his vineyard, in his creation, in order for us to care for it. In Genesis 1, 28, we are commanded, or our first parents were commanded, to fill the earth and have dominion over it. The Hebrew word for fill means to replenish. The word dominion is a Hebrew word that means to give care to someone or to be a caregiver. So God at the beginning of creation was saying, I'm placing you here in my vineyard, in my world, and you are to replenish it and to care for it. You're not to pollute it. You're not to rape the land. You're not to wear the soil out by overproduction. You're not to cut down all the trees. You're not to do other things that cause either rivers to overflow or to dry up because of what you have done. You're to replenish the earth and to care for it. It's something you value, it's something you treasure. In chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 15, we read God giving these instructions. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. The word tend is a Hebrew word that means to serve. It's a word that has that idea that you are serving someone. Not that you are being a servant or lord over something. So it's saying God put man into the garden and told him to serve creation. 
In other words, to do what was necessary so that the flowers would continue to bloom, the plants would continue to grow, the trees would continue to give shade, that all would go well. The word keep it means to guard something, to protect it, or to attend to it. So God never gave us a blank check to just do with the world what we want. He did not give us a blank check to say that just because of cultural advances and technological advances and scientific advances that you can just mess my world up. He said, no, protect it, keep it, attend to it. We are much like the parable. God is the landowner and we are the tenants. God has provided with us what we need to live and we give back to God what is His. You've often heard me talk about my growing up on my grandmother's farm. And the reason I grew up on my grandmother's farm was when I was in the second grade, my grandfather died. Her husband, my mom's dad. And my mother was the youngest of the four children. And for some reason it was decided that mom and dad could pick up and sell their house and move out to the farm and it would be less <coughs> disruptive than her older sisters her older brother selling their homes and picking up and moving out the farm. And of course, Grandma was adamant that she was not going to move from the farm. You know, my mother and her brothers and sisters had been raised there. She had lived there ever since she had been married to my grandfather. And she went about to get the farm up. So we moved out on the farm. But my dad, even though when he was growing up as a kid, in the summers would often spend times with aunts and uncles who lived on a farm was, was an educator. He wanted a farm. And so my grandmother did like the landowner in the parable. She would, she had a tenant farm. A fellow who would come out and he would till the land, he would plant the seed, he would harvest it in the fall. And then when the harvest was done, the money was made, he would come to my grandmother. My grandmother would then give him his share she would keep her share. Well, the reality is we're all tenant farmers in the eyes of God. We're all tenants in God's vineyard, placed here to work for God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And being God's tenants, we are put here to enable God's vineyard to produce. We are to value what God has given us, and we are to give a return to God of what we have. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. Not one of the three, not two out of three, but three out of three. Just as the landowner gave the vineyard to the tenants to raise the grapes and to harvest the grapes and to make money so they could divide it equally, God has given you time, talent, and treasure to use not just to support your family, not just to support your career or your life, but he's given you time, talent, and treasure to use in his church, to use in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To all of us, he has given time, talent, and treasure to be used to his glory. We are to put God first as a tenant puts the land more first. We are not to wait around until we've bought all of the trinkets, all of the luxuries, all of the commodities, all of what we think we have to have in order to keep up with the Joneses. And then after we've done that, give the few pennies we have left to God. No, as tenants, we give God first. And then we give to whomever else we want to give of our time, our talent. And their treasure. God is first. We are obligated to God. We are responsible to God. God doesn't revolve around us. We revolve around God. But today, I think there are people who have that backwards. I think there are people living today who think, really think, that God revolves around them instead of them revolving around God. 
God does not revolve around us. He's the land. We're the temple. We revolve around him. We give to him back what he has given us. And so that we will not be confused, so that we will not be dismayed, so that we will not be disheartened or disillusioned, God has sent his messengers to share with us his word, to share with us his word so that we might know how to live in this world that he has created. God's word is truth. And from that truth, we learn how to live in God's vineyard. We learn how to care for his vineyard. We learn how to make his vineyard produce. When you think about it, God's word is like the instruction manual to a machine or an appliance or a game. You buy a new machine, you're not familiar with it, you read the instruction manual. Or you should. I know there's some that like to buy something, just try to use it without reading the instructions. But then it doesn't work and you wonder why, and then you go back and read the instruction manual and you find out how silly you were by not doing some simple procedure that you would have known if you'd read the instructions. Or if you buy a game, you sit down and you read the instructions to the game. Find out how it's to be played. Well, that's what God's Word of Truth is for us. It's a manual on how to live in life. It's a manual on how to live in His vineyard. It's a manual for how to harvest His vineyard. It's a manual for how to give back to the landlord what is His when we harvest that vineyard. And it is the guide for how to live life and live in abundance. <clears throat> Contrary to popular belief, Abundant life does not mean an abundance of things. Abundant life does not mean having the most, or being the most powerful, or being the most popular. Abundant life is a life lived according to God's will. A life lived according to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I can remember, as probably many of you read the same stories, that after Ellis Presley passed away, stories about how when his daughter was born and began to be a little girl enjoying things that she wanted to go see a Disney movie. And what did Ellis have to do? He'd have to go to the theater and rent it out at midnight for him, his daughter, and whoever else he wanted to take. Because he was so popular, he couldn't go to Cinema 10 or the Mall 5 like we can. And just go in, buy our tickets, sit down, and nobody bothers or even probably even notice that we're there. Unless we start being obnoxious or something. He couldn't do that. Or if his daughter wanted to go to Disney World, or Disneyland, or King's Island, or Dollywood, he'd have to rent it all out at midnight. And he and his entourage, they would go through all the rides and all that. Now there were a lot of people that didn't need Elvis. A lot of people said they wish they had his cars and his home and his money. But that wasn't abundant living. It was like living in a cage. It was being a prisoner of your own family. You hear that from a lot of people that are famous. Talking about how fame can be a prison. I remember they asked Peyton Manning one time when he was still with the Indianapolis Colts when he was so popular in those years in Indianapolis. They said, what do you do when you go out to disguise yourself so people won't recognize who you are? His response was, I wear my own jersey because nobody believes it's really me. And I can wear my own jersey. See, that's not abundant living. That's being a prisoner to your family. But God's word tells us how to live life above them, how to live in that vineyard, how to harvest that vineyard. And then when the time was right, he sent to us the living word, his son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Sent him to us to reveal to us completely God's love for us. But the people didn't want to listen to God, but to Jesus. They wanted to lay claim to the vineyard themselves. They wanted to lay claim to 
the world themselves. Just like our first parents back in the garden. They gave in to the temptation of Satan. Satan convinced them that they should lay claim to the garden. Why should God run it? Why should God forbid you from eating of that tree or the knowledge of good and evil? You're the ones here on earth. You're the ones caring for it. You're the ones protecting it. Keep it. Go ahead and eat it. Claim the garden for yourself. What happened? The paradise came to an end. And they were expelled from the garden. Some centuries later, we see a crowd gathered together on the plain Shanir trying to build a tire up to heaven. The idea they were going to build all the way to heaven and kick God out and lay claim to heaven. So if they could rule the world. Well, that's what we did with Jesus Christ. We tried to lay claim to the vineyard. So our sin crucified him. And those who were against him and wanted to lay claim to the world thought they had been triumphant. But they found out in reality they had lost. For on that third day he rose from the dead. His death paid the debt of sin that we owe. Forty days later he ascended and all those believe in him. Have that salvation through faith <clears throat> by grace. God did this out of his love for us so that we would have Jesus with us as we continue to toil in the vineyard of his creation. Now more than ever, as children of the Heavenly Father, through our baptism and faith in Jesus Christ, we are responsible to work in God's vineyard according to his will. Failing to do so could result in expulsion from the vineyard, just like we read about in the parable. <laughs> Jesus tells us what happened, and he asked the crowd, what will the landowner do? After they've killed his son, beaten up all his prophets, they said they will kill those wicked men and give them a miserable death and lease the vineyard to tenants who will give him the fruits of the harvest. We have been claimed by Christ to be those workers in the vineyard, to be those new workers in the world who give back to God what he has given us and do not try to hoard it from him or keep it from him. As children of the Heavenly Father, as those claimed by Jesus Christ, we know whose world it is. It is not our world. <clears throat> we are to replenish it. We are to keep it. We are to protect it. We are to attend to it. We are to preserve it. And when the harvest comes, then we are to give God his fair share. Ignore God. Try to lay claim, lay claim to the world on your own, and you reap nothing but destruction. But be faithful. Work it in the vineyard. Recognize he's the landowner and you're the tenant. Give him back your time, your talent, and your treasure, first of all, and then give the rest to your other responsibilities. And not only will you share the fruits of the vineyard, but you will share in the fruits of everlasting life. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We will now sing in Numbers 719, where cross the crowd of the ways of life. Hymn number 700. The hymn was written by Frank North, who lived 1850 to 1935. Music was written by W. Gardner. Sacred music follows the theme. God tells us how to live, to tend the vineyard, and cross the crowded ways of life. And then we end up, after our lives here, we shall come to see the city of God and the face of God.
He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Living in the gift of the baptismal grace, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who long to experience God's compassionate love. Our response today is hear our prayer. God of the vineyard, you call us to work in your fields with righteousness and justice. May your creative purpose take root in our lives, bearing good fruit in our living and serving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all who serve in your church, those who make music or coffee, those who teach Sunday school or count money, those who care for this worship place and building, those who usher or read the lessons, those who sing or assist in worship, those who play instruments or prepare meals, and those who volunteer their time and talent. Grant wisdom to all pastors and bishops, and may all your servants be infused with joy in their serving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Greed and injustice infect our world, our nation, and ourselves. Curb the sinful impulses that fuel desire for unjust advantage over others. And bring us under your righteous rule. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our hearts are filled with many questions and needs for ourselves, friends, loved ones, and strangers. Grant healing to all who need it in any way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the great company of saints, especially those whose witness nurtured us in faith and who now rest from their labors. May we join their chorus when our earthly labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your loving arms we entrust all for whom we pray, confident in your mercy, through the grace of the risen one, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world, to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. And the night which is betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink sin. This cup is new covenant in my blood, shed for you for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his sire to command, his life giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to the Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, to bless us, your servants, and these your gifts of bread and wine, so that we, and all who share in the body and blood of Christ, may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your sins. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be our honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. our church are now receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We believe in the real presence of the body in the elements in the blood and the elements of Holy Communion. And we do feel God's presence within us afterwards. Many feel, some feel electric shock, others feel the breath of God on them, others just feel peace.
us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We conclude our celebration with the Lord is my shepherd, hymn number 778. This hymn, The Lord is My Shepherd, is from the Spanish Psalter. It's, it's a psalm. It was written in 1650. And the melody was written in 1850 by Jesse Irvin, who is a uh, woman who lived in a Scottish village. Her father was a uh, minister of the Presbyterian Church. It's a Scottish Psalter. 1650, The Lord is My Shepherd. We've all received Holy Communion. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're united with the presence of God. We're all one in the Spirit. We received eternal life as promised from Jesus.